Fulfill Radio, a voice you can trust. Broadcasting live presents Two Guys and a Bible with Don Preston and William Bell. Join us each week at 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Central as we bring you exciting, sound, challenging, and comforting messages regarding the end times. Thank you for tuning in today. Don Preston is the founder of Preterist Research Institute, or PRI. Don is a prolific author, having written and published 19 books, a host of audio and DVD studies, and is a debater and defender of the full preterist view. His websites are BibleProphecy.com, Eschatology.org, and DonKPreston.com. William Bell is the founder of AllThingsFulfilled.com Ministries and has a website bearing the same name, and has authored three books, audios, and DVDs. He has published hundreds of articles and recordings. And now, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Two Guys in a Bible broadcast with Don Preston and William Bell. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is William Bell, and with me is Don Preston, and welcome to Two Guys in a Bible right here on Fulfill Radio, a voice you can trust. Don, how are you today? Hello, Don. Are you there? Well, let's see, ladies and gentlemen. I had some problems getting in on the line, and uh, maybe that's why I'm not able to hear Don. So we're going to try to um, uh, get him uh, on the line, get connected. So give me um, a second while we're doing that. I'm sure he can probably hear me, but I can't hear him. And um, I'm not sure what actually happened today <laughs> with um, our uh attempt to connect but apparently uh, some of it's affecting him as well so let's see what we got here um yep he's in there and um but i can't um i can't hear him um we're going to be discussing uh, at the bellevue lectures um his lesson that he did and uh, we'll be talking about that shortly but in the meantime let's see if we can find a way to get uh done on the um on the air let's see try something else here don are you there i know that you are on the air because i can see um from the panel but there was something wrong with um with the dashboard today and uh, in the studio and i'm not sure exactly what that is and why it's uh, behaving the way it's doing, uh, but it would not allow me to dial in from the normal platform that we use, and so I'm having to use my phone or headset. And you may have to um, have to dial in. Uh, let me um, give you a number that you can dial in direct, and let's see if that even works. Uh, let's see what's going on here. We'll try this for a second, see if we can get you in. And it's still not working, ladies and gentlemen. Just stand by. Uh, we are trying to get the um, get the studio t- um, technical issues squared up, so we can proceed with our broadcast today. All right, uh, Don, you may have to call in. Let me give you this number. So get a okay. pen handy. If you can okay. hear me, uh, all right, there you are. What okay. happened? I don't know. I've been right. I've been right here the whole time. Okay. Well, I have no clue what happened either. I couldn't even get in on my um, headset and, and through um, through Skype, so I'm having to sit here and hold the phone, <laughs> which I just kept <laughs> doing. <laughs> well, uh, you know, as I texted you just before uh called in, I, I went to log in, and I went to call in, and all of a sudden Skype, they didn't even give me a choice about it. It says we're going to upgrade your Skype to the newest version, mm. and so there it goes. And I'm going, well, wait a minute, I've got a radio program to do, <laughs> but it it literally did did not even give me the option and to do it later. It just started it, and it was in the midst of it. And I'm having to sit here and go, okay, okay, no, don't do this, don't do that, and trying to make the decisions on what parts to add and what parts to not, and. Um, but it finally came up, brought up uh, my contacts list, and said, call. And so I dialed right in. Boy, it just dialed right in to Blog Talk. And I could hear you just fine, no question about it. 
But then, you know, you obviously couldn't hear me, so I have no earthly idea what's going on here. Um, but like you said, it's it's just technology and the wonders of technology. Yeah, yeah. Well, when I dial in on my headset, um, you know, it asked me to put in a PIN number, which I'd never have done, and then when I tried it, <laughs> it didn't work. So Didn't uh, like that, it. <laughs> yeah, after about three or four times of that, going through the – Doing the same thing over and over, I said, okay, let's just stop this nonsense and, and try to get some of the guests done. Okay, well, we're here, ladies and gentlemen, and um, we are um, going to do a little bit of critique on the Bellevue Lectures. Uh, we have started this, and we've had quite a bit of interest in this um, uh, these series of critiques and the broadcast, and uh, we may have one gentleman out there listening. He asked if we could, uh, you know, have a way to download these. I'm going to try to work that out for him. So if you are uh, listening to us, that's what we'll try to do. I know a lot of people can't listen at this time, and so they come back and listen to the archives, uh, which are available within about 15 minutes of our completing the live broadcast. And so you'll be able to listen from that, um, you know, from that time forward. Uh, but we can also see if we can get these downloaded where we can place them on a website so you can uh, find them easier and um, be able to listen to them. At any rate, uh, Don, we uh, had talked about doing a review of Danny Douglas' uh, lecture, and uh, we might have to combine two of them. I did get a chance to listen a little bit to the um, uh, well, pretty much most of the Joel lecture, and um, what it amazes me is how little sometimes arguments are being made in these presentations that are supposed to be refutations of what we say. And uh, well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's you know, it's just amazing to me. Um, I, I have you know videos online and and um, sometimes go back and forth with people on Google Hangouts and on YouTube videos and even on Facebook, for that matter, and I can get more arguments out of them than I get out of these speeches that's going on here. So we almost <laughs> we almost have to make the arguments for them and then refute them. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> what you're saying is absolutely true uh, in regard to Mr. Douglas. Now, I don't know if something happened to the video and the audio on the uh, website for the Bellevue Church of Christ Lectures or not, but Three times today, I've gotten on there to try to watch the entirety of, of his speech. And at, at approximately the 10-minute, 34-second mark, it's over. And I'm sitting there going, oh, wait a minute. It shows at, on, on the little time bar, on the little audio bar, it shows that there's a pres presentation there of about 34, 35 minutes. But when you move the button to anywhere else past the 1034 uh, mark, it's totally silent. Now, I don't know if that's something on my computer. I don't know if it's my technology. I don't know if they've got a glitch. I don't know if it didn't get fully recorded. I don't know. I, I really honestly have no earthly idea why it's doing that, but I found myself, as he was going along there, I, <laughs> I kept thinking, when... Is he going to make an argument? When is he going to get into some text and begin to do some exegesis? Uh, just like you were saying there, William, you know, you sit, you listen, you just wait, and you wait, and you wait. Mostly what you hear is, I can't believe anybody could be ignorant enough unlearned enough to believe such a crazy doctrine. That's how Mr. Douglas began. Crazy. And that's what I mean. He said, this is a crazy doctrine. And so you're going, well, okay, why don't you share with the audience why it's crazy by actually going to a text and giving, giving us some linguistic, some grammatical argumentation that is really based on sound logic. It's not based on presuppositions. Uh, it's not, not based on the tradition of the churches of Christ. It's not just anybody can read this verse and see that these people are damnable heretics. 
I, it's like, sorry, that's not an argument. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And uh, uh, and so it's, it's very disappointing. Yeah, it it really is because you know, believe it or not, there are quite a few learning opportunities to hear positions discussed back and forth with the pros and cons. And uh, I tell you, you know, I've picked up some good arguments and good teaching just listening to other people try to refute it <laughs> um, because you le- you learn things that you otherwise wouldn't know. And there are some things that I learned that I might have been off on a point or two here and there. Nothing that affects the overall uh, view, but maybe there are some nuances there that I hadn't taken a look at. So, I mean, you know, it's it's um, a good thing for us to critique and for us to listen to the two dialogues going back and forth. But when you know you come to the table and you don't offer anything, it's it's as you say, it's like a disappointment. So uh, we're well, going to have to make a, go ahead. Yeah, there, there's there's another issue here. There there was an awful lot of back padding. Uh, I'm okay. You're okay. Yes. I'm faithful and you're faithful, and there are a bunch of heretics going on. Now, I understand why that goes on to a certain extent. I mean, after all, Bellevue did not invite a bunch of speakers to come down there and, and to and to present widely dis, uh, disparate views. I, we all understand that. Uh, so I, I didn't expect one speaker to get up and say, well, hey, guess what, guys? I agree with these heretics. I believe the Lord came back in AD 70. But <clears throat> there is... A visible fear, and William, I've seen it at lectureships. You've seen it at lectureships. There is a tangible fear on the part of some speakers, lest they say anything against the party line. Now, today I was also listening to Brother Doug Post. Now, I don't know Brother Doug Post. Uh, He's a relatively new name to me, but obviously he's considered to be sound by the Bellevue elders. That's why they asked him. Well, I was absolutely amazed, William, to learn, as he stated, almost apologetically, and this is what I mean, that he takes the early dating of Revelation view and even sees that it applied to the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. And <laughs> I was I, I was sitting and I was watching the video, and I could not help but laugh out loud when Brother Doug Post said, "Now I happen to believe I happen to take the position that Revelation was in fact written prior to the fall of Jerusalem, and that it addresses that issue." But now I'm not here to discuss that. And that's not the issue. Well, of course, Howard Denham, that horribly caustic uh, representative of the Bellevue congregation, he he doesn't take the late date, but he takes a mid, what they call a mid date, uh, somewhere in the 70s, after the fall of Jerusalem, probably in the reign of Vespasian, if I remember what he said correctly. And so there are others there who are undoubtedly late-date advocates. Now, let me tell you what, folks. Doug Post was absolutely wrong when he said it's not an issue. Because if Babylon of Revelation was first century Jerusalem, guess what? The coming of the Lord in Revelation was against Jerusalem. Secondly, if it was Rome then it wasn't Jerusalem. But if it was Rome, <clears throat> then the coming of the Lord of Revelation 19 was against Rome. And, by the way, that makes them some kind of preterist, doesn't it, William? That's right. <laughs> and, and so I... Uh, and, and let me back up here a little bit. Doug, This Doug Post has been posting some pretty sarcastic, pretty hateful things on my Don K. Preston uh, website in response to my article, Is Don Preston Afraid to Debate? Now, in that article, I gave my reasons why I will not debate 
Howard Denham. Howard Denham is one of the most caustic, ungodly men in correspondence that I have ever encountered. I have asked him, I've basically begged him in private correspondence to drop the name calling, stop the verbiage, and engage in respectful, honorable discussions with me, and I would debate him. Well, the trouble of it is, Howard Denham wanted to make every single demand and would not negotiate so much as one single item. He proposed a proposition to me, which is so vague, so generic, and as anyone who understands debate properly will tell you, you should make your proposition as precise and as clear and as unambiguous as possible. Howard Denham submitted a proposition to me that said the resurrection of the dead is yet future. And I said, Howard, that proposition is not precise. Well, of course, he just went on a rant and a rave about that. It is absolutely precise. You're just scared to death. You're a hypocrite. You're a liar. You're a snake in the grass because you will not sign that proposition. Well, as I was pointing out to some people who were wondering why I would not debate him, <clears throat> my response was this. As I just stated, any debate proposition needs to be as precise, technically precise, as possible. So here, let me pose the problem with Howard Denham's proposition. By resurrection of the dead, does he mean Israel as the dead in Ezekiel 37? Does he mean those who are spiritually dead, as in Ephesians chapter 2? Does he mean the corporate deadness that Paul refers to in Colossians chapter 3 <clears throat> when he says when Christ uh, you died with Christ you all died with Christ but when Christ who is our life shall appear then shall we all appear with him in glory is that the resurrection he's talking about I mean is he talking about the resurrection of Romans chapter 6 which resurrection of the dead does Howard Denham have in mind so when I even posed those questions to Howard Denham and said, let me submit the following proposition. I will affirm the following. Reserve. The Bible teaches that the resurrection of the dead, the overcoming of the death brought in by Adam, the death of 1 Corinthians 15, was fulfilled at the time of the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. He said, I'm not going to allow you to define my terms. I will not sign that complex proposition. I said, okay, then why don't you just simply say that you will affirm the resurrection of the dead, as foretold in 1 Corinthians 15, is yet future. He absolutely adamantly refused. I mean, at least that's a little more precise. So anyway, my point being, this Doug Post has been posting a sarcastic hateful little post, calling me an absolute coward for refusing to debate Howard Denham for four nights. Well, Howard Denham demanded, he didn't ask, he didn't, would not negotiate, demanded that the debate be right here in Ardmore, Oklahoma, and that, I mean, basically, he demanded that he be in total charge. Well, that's unheard of. It is disrespectful, it is dishonorable, it is unheard of in debate protocol for one man to set all of the terms of a debate. And yet that's precisely what Howard Denham was attempting to do. And so, when you, folks, when you get a, a feel, and, and I recommend you go to my website, DonKPreston.com, and just read the comments by Doug Post. As I have urged him, number one, I urged him to listen to the program tonight and the, the last week. Number two, I urged him to read my, my article responding to Howard Denham's, uh, one of the Howard Denham's syllogisms, and to write a refutation or to listen to the radio program and to show us where we're wrong. He will not do it, William. He refuses to even acknowledge that I have asked him to do it. All he does in post after post, you're a coward to debate. Howard Denham. <laughs> You're just afraid that he will hand you your head in a hat. It's just, you know, the, the attitude 
of the men who were speaking on the Bellevue Lectureship. I finally asked Doug Post today when I pointed out to him that Second Timothy chapter two twenty four demands the proper attitude and the and demands the proper conduct in Christian controversy. And I just asked him, do you not believe that attitude matters? He responded by saying Second Timothy two twenty four has nothing to do with Howard Denham's attitude. Oh, wow. So he's above the scriptures now. He is and... above the scriptures. He, he is above the necessity to conduct himself as an honorable, respectful fellow believer in Christ. I don't care if he b- thinks I'm a heretic or not. Let's see. Um, we're supposed to gently rebuke one another, are we not? Howard Denham seems to think that the only way to deal with someone with whom he disagrees is to call them every rotten, low-down adjective, basically, in the book, stopping just slightly short, just ever so slightly short of using vulgarities. It's just deplorable. But back to the point. You know, in regard to Brother Douglas's presentation, William, what was the main point, if you can even call it a point, what was the main point that you gleaned from his shortened presentation? Now, that was ve- that's very difficult. <laughs> and, I, and I took a page and a half of notes. Uh, <laughs> the main thing that I can recall uh, him saying was that um it destroys hope or something like that you know it was it was nothing substantive from my point of view uh and you know we we discussed that but um i can't figure out his point and he he was supposed to be talking about partial versus full preterism and i don't recall him making one single argument that distinguished the two or even defined uh the two he did define preterism but he never made any distinction between uh, the two that that I recall in terms of any any substantive argument, and, uh, and you know, so I'm sitting here saying, okay, now what are we going to, um, you know, to deal with with this? He talked about you know some prophecies fulfilled um, in the kingdom, uh, Mark nine one and Acts, you know, chapter one and. Etc. Uh, and like I said, I got plenty of the notes here, and he mentions full preterism uh, and says that the second coming um, and there, you know, has occurred. There's no future return. Uh, the resurrection occurred. No resurrection of the body. The day of judgment and the end of the world all happened, you know, basically in 70 A.D. And uh, but the arguments for anything else, I, I really didn't get. So maybe I missed that. Well, I, I did. I'm like you. Yeah, I, you know, I found myself, you know, all he did, literally all he did was he threw out a lot of verses there, uh, did not exegete a single one. This gets back to a point that we were talking about, William. You know, you and I, uh, here on Two Guys in the Bible, we have we have spent tremendous amount, amounts of time, for instance, going through the little apocalypse, for instance, doing a an extensive study of the theme of, of Zion. Uh, we've done special studies on resurrection. And when we go to text, we go there and we do linguistic studies. We go there and we look at the context, the verses before, the verses after. We go to other passages that deal with the exact same thing. Uh, you know, we, we try our best to give the uh, the audience the... Uh, a good feel for what the text actually is saying. We we don't just say, well, you know, my position is uh, 1 Corinthians 15 supports my view. Okay, Uh, 1 Thessalonians proves exactly what I'm saying here. Uh, Folks, that's not exegesis. Um, It's the farthest thing from exegesis. I'm uh, I'm reminded of a public debate I had a few years back, uh, William, with John Welch in Indianapolis. This was so ironic. Uh, 
in preparation for that debate, I found a debate book that John Welch's father had debated a dispensationalist. The dispensationalist simply got up and read a bunch of verses, and you know some of those verses, what they would have been. The wolf would lie down with the lamb. The child will play on the hole of the adder, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And this dispensationalist got up and said, See, does it sound to you, does it look to you like this has been fulfilled? What does it sound like when you read these verses? Do you think, as you look around, do you think this has happened? Well, John Welch's father got up and responded and said, you know, my opponent says, well, just read it. Anybody can read it. It, it, say, it means what it says and says what it means. And we haven't seen this fulfilled. And Brother Welch's father said, folks, that is not exegesis. That proves absolutely nothing. You, anybody can quote a verse, but just quoting a verse, just reading a verse, proves nothing whatsoever. You have to do exegesis. What did John Welsh do? He got up and read 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and he turns to the audience and says, Ladies and gentlemen, what does that sound like to you? I haven't seen that happen. Have you seen that happen? All you've got to do is read the verses. Well, that's precisely what was happening at the Bellevue Lectures. They would get up there and they would say, or they might, some of them might read a verse. Most of them did just exactly like Brother Douglas. All he did was cite the verse, whether it be Second Peter 3 or 1 Corinthians 15 or whatever that verse is, and say, there, see, these preterists are crazy. Anybody can know that. Well, once again, folks, that's not exegesis. It is simply not presenting. It's not an exercise in hermeneutic. Hermeneutic is exploring who, what, when, where, why, and how. And William, I, you know, of the lessons that I've listened to so far, I have not heard one single speaker carefully and closely practice good hermeneutic. Now, the brother that addressed Joel 2 sort of kind of hedged and, you know, touched the hem of the garment and then went from there, as the saying goes. And so it gets back to the point that we began with at the very first of the program. As we listen to the lectures at the Bellevue Lectureship, you sit asking yourself, where is the argument? Where's the logic? Where's the exegesis? Don't stand up and, and just say over and over and over again, these preterists are heretics. Everybody knows they're heretics, and we've got to destroy this doctor. I don't know how many times Brother Douglas said, we've got to destroy this doctrine. Well, how about offering some exegesis? How about offering some compelling logic? How about instead of getting on the the interweb, to use the term, and on my website, for instance, like Brother Post did, and just simply say, you're a coward, you're a coward, you're a coward. Well, where's the evidence of that? Instead of basically surrendering your position, oh, by the way, I don't, I don't know if you've listened to any of Brother Doug Post's uh, presentation at all yet or not, William. To who? But uh, brother uh, Doug Post is his name, I believe. No, I haven't Last listened to his yet. Okay. Well, he made a very powerful point by saying, John begins the book with the Father saying, or with the Holy Spirit causing him to say, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show to his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he said, folks, I want to tell you something. It's very, very important here. And he said, when God says something is at hand, he's not playing games. And there is no subcontext in which he doesn't mean it's not really at hand. When Jesus said, and when the apostles said, something was near, at hand, and coming shortly, you can bet it was truly at hand. Of course, I'm sitting there listening to it going... <laughs> well, he just refuted everybody in the lecture. <laughs> <laughs> he just refuted every single speaker. Because, after all, Doug McClish 
who, when he's arguing against dispensationalist, he knows precisely what at hand, quickly, shortly, and soon means. It can't mean 2,000 years. But in his presentation on Acts chapter 2, Jeff McClish referenced Matthew chapter 3, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and he defined the at hand there as nearby. He defined it spatially instead of temporally. And that, I can tell you right now, historically, brethren in the churches of Christ do not do that. Uh, that is, unless they're trying to argue against preterists. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> When they're arguing against dispensationalists, I want to tell you right now, at hand does not mean 2,000 years. And if you say it does, that's infidelity. So said Wayne Jackson in his little book, Premillennialism or Dispensationalism, A System of Infidelity. So, I mean, it's just remarkable when you hear these guys try to make an argument Okay, Doug Post is standing up there arguing that the book of Revelation supposedly refutes covenant eschatology. Well, we haven't got there, and we're, we'll spend some time on his, uh, on his lecture on Revelation at a different time. But the point being, you cannot stand up there and say, when God says these things must shortly come to pass, and then go to the book. You know what, William? You know, you know of course, what he's going to do. He's going to try to go to the book and find something that was not really at hand even though God said the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show to his servant things, not some things, but things which must shortly come to pass, the time is at hand. He didn't say the time for some of these things is at hand. Matter of fact, he even said in Revelation 119, John was told to write concerning the things which have been, the things which are, and the things which are about to come. He didn't add, and oh, by the way, part of this is not about to come. Part of it's a long time off. Well, anyway, I'm getting, I'm getting ahead of us in our discussion of Doug Post's uh, <laughs> presentation on, uh, on Revelation. But, William, one, I guess the key thing that stuck out to me on Brother Douglas' uh, presentation, and again, on my Internet connection, for some reason... It cut him off. It gave the conclusion of his lesson at a little over ten and a half minutes. And it it had him saying, uh, there are some people here that need to repent and return to the Lord. There are some people here tonight that need to come to the Lord and be baptized. And we ask you to do that as together we stand and sing. And like you and I were jokingly saying, it's true, it's not a joke, but in the Church of Christ, that's the end of the whole show right there. When the preacher says, as together we stand and sing, sermon's over. And that's what was at the 10-minute, 34-second, you know, mark. So, again, I don't know if he said anything else. I don't know why it listed 34 minutes, and I'm certainly not going to give any kind of ulterior uh, situation there. I'm just saying what happened on my computer. But in the slightly over 10 minutes that I heard him speak, Seemingly out of absolute thin air, he made the comment, if these people are right, there is no hope of heaven for us. He claimed repeatedly, oh, yeah. we, do, said that. we do not have eternal life today if these people are right. Now, the next speaker uh uh, Brother Stoltz, or whatever his name was, I, forget, I apologize for forgetting his name, but on, the speaker on Joel, he reiterated that point. He said, if these brethren are right, we just die, and that's all there is. I mean, I am just, I'm not only stunned, I'm extremely offended that these brethren are so close-minded They are so unwilling to study. They are so unwilling to listen to what we actually say that they would actually stand in front of a group of people, be filmed, and thus be watched 
in America and perhaps around the world for people to hear them utter a blatant falsehood. That kind of makes me mad. Yeah, Not well, from you know the that it, the ones that I lectures that I've heard, I have not heard anyone. Um, I well, actually, I thought Pogue did a better job of trying to prove his point than some of the others that I've listened to so far. You know, at least he tried to make some arguments, and uh, I mean they were wrong, but I mean he tried. He tried to establish the church completely at Pentecost, but he made an effort, you know, to do it, and he yeah. cited some passages. Yes. In the process, uh, but to, to to say that you're refuting a doctrine and you don't try to uh, focus on you know specific statements or arguments that are made and then show exegetically why they are not the case. I mean, can you imagine the time and effort we put into looking up a person's position, studying it, researching it, trying to uh, iron out all of the things that they are saying so that we don't misrepresent them because you can't really refute a person's doctrine if you don't understand what they're saying you know you and if you don't uh, represent them correctly exactly you're just fighting a straw man or something or it's you know so it's important to us to make sure that we are understanding you and and then to get up as you say and do that in public i'm really totally embarrassed at the job that some of these men did i haven't heard all of them but no, no, you know, I haven't I'm either. Just, I'm, I'm embarrassed for what they claimed that they were coming to do and then failed to do. And I have heard previous lectures from Bellevue that dealt with some of this, and they did a much better job. I'm wondering where those guys are now. Maybe maybe they're <laughs> incubating right now um, because they are, you know, studying this view. <laughs> Uh, because I'm, I, I don't know, know where they're at either. <laughs> I really I don't know where they're at. There's, I mean, Don, there has to be something going on. Maybe some of these guys are studying and they're learning, and they don't want to be a part of, you know, vehemently denying it anymore. Because I didn't hear the kind of people that I'm no, normally accustomed to hearing that do exegesis of Scripture. Yeah, I, I'm like you, William. Um, you know, if I, I have to be very, very honest here. If if I had organized a seminar, a seminar, which obviously I do every year, uh, Preter's Pilgrim Weekend is coming up next week. As a matter of fact, I hope everyone will make their plans to be here. By the way, uh, but be that as it may, if I organized a seminar. And I put in the effort, spent the money to bring men in from around the world, for, from around the nation. And I expected them to give lessons. I would expect them to give lessons that would be worth people's time. Lessons that were well-studied, well-reasoned, and what have you. You know, I don't even have to agree with every single point that a speaker makes. We've had that at Preterist Pilgrim Weekend uh, in the past because I give the speakers the liberty and the freedom. Now, in Q&A session, they may be taken to task for that. Uh, uh, some points that they made because people in the audience catch up or you'll know, pick up on those differences and say, hey, you know, uh, so-and-so, you said this, and uh, Brother Bell's position is this, or Don's position is that, or such-and-such. Uh, can you explain the difference? That's great. That's wonderful because it allows us to hash out some of those differences. Well, <laughs> you know, I was in here thinking we probably had better debates among ourselves in our Q and A's. I guarantee you we have. <laughs> but you know, look, had I spent the money to bring in speakers as they did at Bellevue and like I do every year. And a man stood up and gave a presentation that was no better than what Brother Douglas gave. And I'm not singling him out. It's just that he happens to be the one we're examining tonight. But if that's the best that he gave me, he would never speak on my seminar again. Now, perhaps, as I've already stated, perhaps some technology got in the way and 
maybe he had more after the 1034 mark or something like that. Like I said, he definitely said, as together we stand and sing, which would indicate show's over, uh, I'm done, let's let's all you know do whatever. But based upon what I heard him say, based upon the lack of depth, depth based upon the lack of research, based upon the blatant misrepresentation, the blatant falsehood about what we supposedly believe, and the utter lack of exegesis, up to simply get up and say they're a bunch of heretics, that wouldn't cut it with me. You know, normally, uh, well, not norm, just normally, I don't pick men to be on my lectureship that I do not believe with all of my heart, based upon what others have said about them or what I have heard them, uh, when I've heard them speak myself, I don't choose men that I don't believe will give my audience a really good, meaty presentation. Now, every speaker is different. I understand that. Methodologies are different. Presentation styles are different. But I don't care what your style is. You can give substance. You, you can give meat. You can give exegesis. You can practice hermeneutic. And I'm like you, William. From what I've listened to so far, uh, I haven't heard any of it. You know, perhaps when we get down in, into some of the other speeches, and I, I do want to say this, uh, the brother that raised the issue or was uh, told to address Joel, chapter 2, or the book of Joel, uh, he made a few comments right at the very front, uh, very first of his presentation, uh, about noticing the local and immediate application as well as the last day's application. I thought, well, okay, that's uh, <laughs> at least that's a beginning because that's what Joel actually says. There was an at-hand application. There was an at-hand day of the Lord. There was a far-off day of the Lord, and I'm going. Okay, good. Okay, that's that's a pretty decent start. And and I haven't listened to that entire lecture. Um, perhaps you have. So I don't know if he went ahead to say that the great and terrible day of the Lord of Joel two twenty eight and following is still future or not. Did he do that? Um, I, you know I don't remember him saying that. Um, and I'm not saying that he didn't say it. I, I listened to as much of it as I could before, you know, getting on tonight, so I don't think I heard the whole thing. Uh, he was making some arguments on Matthew 25 and, and um, the Jesuit, but to say that he made that particular one, I don't recall. Okay, well, again, I, I haven't been able to listen to it. We will certainly pick up on that next week, Lord willing, yeah. nothing happens. Uh, so we'll we'll certainly pay a whole lot more careful attention to it when we both got more time. <laughs> but you and I were both, uh, uh, the folks don't know this, but you and I were both working on some very, very pressing technological issues. I should say you were working on the technological issues. I was sitting there waiting. Uh, <laughs> but uh, be, be that as it may, um, we just didn't really have a tremendous amount of time uh, to give to listening today. But again, let's return to this point, William. Brother Douglas made the claim. And to me, let me reiterate this. To me, the claim came out of so far out of left field that I saw absolutely no connection with what he said and what he had just said. But he made the statement, if what these brethren are saying are right, that we have no hope of heaven, we have no eternal life. Did did that statement come out of left field to you as well? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, and it, it's another uh, uh, example of you know just really failure to understand what we say, a failure to uh, be open and honest about examining what we say, and then just downright charging us with an error and a falsehood. Well, and, and it goes back to the issue that these brethren have not read what we have written. Max has addressed the issue of life after death. In my book, We Shall Meet Him in the Air, The Wedding of the King of Kings, I have quite a good discussion, as a matter of fact, on life after death. And the fact that we will, that when we die, we don't have to go to a holding pen called Lazarus's bosom and wait there to be judged. That rather, when we die... We are directly in the everlasting presence of God himself, 
in what Hebrews 9 would call the most holy place. Uh, we just simply transition from that from here to there is all that we do uh, in, through the portal of death. So for a man to stand up and say, if these predators are right, we have no hope of heaven and we have no hope of eternal life, obviously he has not read anything that we've written. And that makes it all the more deplorable. Uh, I mean, it's, just, it's such irresponsibility to say, what these brethren believe is this. Well, okay, let me ask you a question, brother. Where did you read that? Where did you read that? Let me, let me make a, a point here. We, we were discussing Howard Denham a few moments ago, uh, and you mentioned that you heard an awful lot of straw man arguments. Well, uh, Howard Denham submitted a list of uh, syllogisms that he said could not be refuted a good little while back. Steve Bayston sent them to me. I'm in the process of responding to the one by one. Well, uh, Howard Denham... In, in the second, by the way, you can see my response to his uh, first uh, syllogism uh, on my website, donkpreston.com. Well, his second syllogism is this, major premise. The church of the New Testament is the kingdom of heaven on earth, Matthew 16, Colossians 1, 1 Thessalonians, etc. Minor premise. The divine institution that God established on earth on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2 is the church of the New Testament. Conclusion. Therefore, the divine institution that God established on earth on the day of Pentecost is the kingdom of heaven on earth. Thus, the kingdom of heaven on earth was not established in AD 70, as realized eschatology claims. Steve Bazin and his minions are false teachers on the subject of the kingdom. Now, I want to tell you what, folks. You want to talk about a straw man argument? If you want to talk about misrepresentation, this entire argument, folks, is based upon Howard Denham's false idea and false charge that preterists claim the church was not established at all on Pentecost. William, have you ever heard any preterists say that, by the way? No, no. <laughs> I haven't either. Never heard Max King say it. Never heard Terry Seibert say it. Never heard any of the predators that I know. Never heard him say it. Never heard them indi never heard them indicate it. I've never read it in any predator's work. And yet the underlying charge of Howard Denham in this so called syllogism and you know, some teachers of logic will tell you that if a if a syllogism is so bad, so um either so poorly, poorly framed or so false in its premises as, or pre, so presuppositional that it really ought to be called a silly chism. Nothing could be more of a silly chism than Howard Denham's argument here that I just read to you. He is arguing from the premise of a false charge that preterists do not believe that the church even began to exist on the day of Pentecost. Uh, it's just like the claim, folks. If preterists are right, we don't have heaven. We can't have eternal life. If the preterists are right, we just die and it's all over. Folks, this is reprehensible. It's unscholarly. It is ungodly to make arguments when you don't even know if what you're arguing is right or not. You know, you know, William, you know how much of a footnote or endnote fanatic I am. You know that when I am saying, well, such and such believes this, or premillennialists believe this, amillennialists believe this, or postmillennialists believe that, Man, I'm going to give you the footnote, I'm going to give you the reference, I'm going to give you the citation, or I'm going to give you half a dozen citations. I'm going to give you the direct quotes themselves. I am a huge believer, number one, in giving honor to whom honor is due. Uh, you know, when, I, when William Bell shares something with me that, that I've never thought of, 
when I'm sharing with sharing it with others, I generally like to say, William Bell shared the following with me. I don't want to give the impression that I thought about that all by myself. I want to give honor to whom honor is due. William put a lot of time, a lot of study, a lot of effort uh, into coming to that conclusion. Well, you know, I shared something with William, uh, I guess it was this morning, on an argument that I had been developing. And I sent it to him. I said, tell me what you think. And William wrote back, and he said, my impression of that is, it's now stolen. (laughs) (laughs) Well, he he had likewise likewise shared uh, a really, really good argument with me, and I wrote back, and I said, well, I guess we're both just a couple of thieves then, because I'm going to steal that too. (laughs) But again, the, the point of it is, journalistic integrity. Polemic integrity, the Christian integrity, would seem to suggest that if you're going to say the preterists believe this, well, okay, uh, what's your proof that they believe in that? G- give me a citation. Now, I did notice something in the brother's presentation on Joel, uh, as far as I got to listen to it, he said, mm-hmm. Max King says on the following pages. And I'm going, okay, that's better. That's better. But when you stand up and say, and by the way, this was a glaring omission, when he said, if these preterists are right, when we die, we're just that's just it. We don't have anything else. Did he give a citation, William? Nope. I didn't, he didn't hear give anything a quote? for that. Nope. I didn't hear a nope. single thing for that. And when Brother Douglas said, if these guys are right, we got no hope for heaven, not a quote, not a reference. And that certainly isn't what we teach. <laughs> Absolutely not. Look, I have said many times, if I don't have the hope of heaven, if I don't have the confidence of heaven, if I don't have the reality of heaven after this life, why in the world would I put my, myself through the abuse that I have put myself, that you put yourself, that literally thousands of others have put themselves through? It's because of our love for the truth. And it's because of our assurance that we are in the presence of God. That you cut out a little bit, Don. I don't know if the audience can hear you, but I can't hear you. Is that any better? That's better, yes. Okay, I don't know what happened. Uh, I was just simply pointing out, William, that those of us who have and continue to undergo, quote, persecution, unquote, abuse, ostracism, if we didn't believe, number one, that truth really matters, and it matters for eternity, it matters for where we go after we die, why in the world would we submit ourselves to the abuse from men like Howard from men like Howard Denham or Doug Post, or we could name off, you know, literally hundreds of names of, of people who just abuse us and ostracize us of friends, former friends, who will not even shake our hands now because we're such heretics. Why would we do that? These men are seemingly great, great judges of character. They seem to think that if anyone disagrees with them, they're automatically dishonest. They're automatically cowards. They're automatically hypocrites. They're snakes in the grass. The the judgmentalism, the Phariseeism, the narrow-mindedness of men like this is absolutely deplorable. And you see it over and over again. You you try to be gentle, you try to be patient, you try to instruct, and yet all you get is everything thrown right back in your teeth. And all you get <clears throat> pardon me. All you get are the slanderous, libelous, blatantly false claims saying that we believe this, saying that we believe that, and not one single attempt is made to document 
the claims that they're making. I, I, I just, uh, I just shake my head in wonderment, William, of that kind of of narrow-minded legalism, that kind of narrow-minded judgmentalism, that automatically jumps to the conclusion: well, if they believe that, then they can't believe in this. And it's unmitigated nonsense. Really, really sad. Well, I certainly agree. I mean, it's uh, like I said. I'm. I, I was so disappointed to have to listen to that and not really receive anything of substance um, that you can deal with. I mean, if he was talking about partial versus full preterism, I mean, tell us what partial preterism is and why you believe it to be the case. Because you know, most of them we know are partial preterists, even if they don't know it. Uh, because they definitely <laughs> take many passages in the Scripture and apply them to 70 A.D. And all our point is, is show us the hermeneutic by which you determine that one passage that says Jesus is coming in the clouds is different from the other. What are the hermeneutical principles you use to determine that? Then we can have a discussion. If you can show us that there is a logical, reason, scriptural um uh, reason that you are doing that, then that's where the discussion begins. But, you know, we know that many of them will start in Matthew chapter 24 and take a passage like verse 30, all the tribes of the land shall mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with great glory. And they will quote verse 34, Assuredly I say to you, this generation will by no means pass till all these things take place. And they'll say, see, there is the destruction of Jerusalem. What do you have? You have Christ coming in the clouds in glory. All the tribes mourn because of him, and those same tribes see him. And then they'll go right over to Revelation 1-7, which is a quote of Matthew 24, both of which are quoted from Zechariah 12, 10 through 14, or 10 through 12, as well as Daniel 7, and say it's talking about the future. And they have no exegetical principle by which to determine that. We're just about out of time, so I'm going to stop there. But I at least wanted to let people know <laughs> the difference between partial and full preterism and why we reject it. And, and the fact of it is, folks, uh, virtually everyone who is now a full preterist began life, as it were, as a partial preterist. But they begin to see the inconsistencies of trying to say, like William was saying, how do you go to Matthew 24, 29 to 34, and have all those constituent elements of the coming of the Son of Man on the clouds, with the sound of a trumpet, with the shout, and the gathering in that generation? Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and you have the same identical constituent elements, the same identical time statements. Oh, but they're different. And we still can't get a good exegetical and hermeneutical reason for delineating between them. Well, look, folks, we're about out of time. Next week, William and I will begin to dissect, we will begin to discuss, and we will share with you the discussion on Joel chapter 2. Uh, William, what's the good brother's name? Stoltz or something like that? Uh, I've forgotten. No, Don, I don't have it. Okay. Um, okay, I apologize. I, I was going to write it down, but be that as it may, uh, we will be discussing Joel chapter 2 and whether or not it refutes coveted eschatology. So, Bruce tell your friends. Stulting. Tell you, Excuse me for interrupting you. Stulting. 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 Okay. Yes. Uh, but we will be discussing his presentation on Joel chapter 2, whether or not it refutes coveted eschatology. That's next Tuesday night, 6 o'clock Central, Two Guys in the Bible, A Voice You Can Trust. Be here with your Bibles open. We'll see you then. Good night. God bless. Thank you for joining the Two Guys in a Bible radio broadcast. On behalf of Dunn Preston and myself, we'd like to say have a very pleasant day and may God bless. Until next time, we'll see you on Fulfill Radio, a voice you can trust.